Welcome to the Your City Podcast, where we get to know our neighbors so that we can be a good neighbor. I'm your host, Aaron Williams. Today, I'm joined by Renee Tui Childress, who is the Executive Director for Dover's Children's Home, which is a local charity here in Dover. We're going to talk with her about what type of work that they do here at the organization, how it impacts the community, and how she came to be involved with it. Renee, thank you for coming on to the show. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited. Yeah, me too. I find that charity conversations are normally the most touching or in, like there's so much to go over with them. And it, ever since my first season, when I did a charity episode, I've been like, okay, I always have to do at least a charity episode. Yeah, I love that. So you have a shout out ready for the city of Dover. Yeah. yeah. Who do you want to shout out? So uh, Bending Bodhi Yoga um, and the owner is Bethany Walker. Um, this year she did an incredible thing for not just our kids, but our staff and giving our kids memberships uh, to be able to do yoga there. And also for our staff to have discounts on doing yoga there because she knows how stressful the work can be. Mm-hmm. Uh, and she's just been an incredible advocate for our work. So definitely want to shout her out. Yeah. When you said our kids, at first I thought your kids. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but what you mean is the kids, the kids here here yeah. at the organization. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So let's talk about the organization. Yeah. What does Dover Children's Home do? Okay. So it's a big question, but uh, so we are um, a residential treatment program. Uh, mm-hmm. We have two programs, actually. So we have a level two independent living program uh, for youth between the ages of 10 and 21. And that's for kids who are stepping down from a higher level of care, uh, who can't be at home for safety reasons, who have trauma that they're kind of working through, and we're providing treatment. Uh, we also have a level one independent living program. So we have a three bedroom apartment and a studio apartment on the property. We can take kids between the ages of 18 and 21 who are working on their own independence. Okay. So that, that's our program kind of in a nutshell. What we do is we provide trauma informed treatment for those youth in hopes to get them to a more permanent place. So that's either a uh, home with their families and reunifying with them or um, into foster care or into adoptive placement. Uh, for the majority of our kids, though, going to live independently mm-hmm. in the community. So you mentioned level zero and level <laughs> level one. one and level two. Yep. Level one and level two. Okay. Yeah. What's the how many levels are there? What is that kind yeah. of ranking? So there's five levels in the state of New Hampshire in terms of residential treatment for youth. So the first one is level one, which is independent living. And so these are the kids that they just have supportive services and case management to be able to support them in moving forward. Uh, level two is intermediate level. So it's community-based, meaning that our kids go to school in the community. Uh, they work in the community. Um, they have mentors in the community, um, but they also do a lot of like uh, extracurricular activities. They're allowed to do typical adolescent things. Mm -hmm. Um, And then there's level three, which is considered uh, residential education. So they get both education and residential treatment services on site. Level four and level five are much higher. So it's considered um, psychiatric residential treatment. So hospitalization um, and safety type placements. Okay. Mm -hmm. I, I thought it was going to be like, as you go up, this increases, but it's more just like different designations. As a, It's not just like, oh, it becomes more hands-on as it goes up. It does. So, oh, it uh, does. Yep. So the ratios change, uh, their treatment changes, um, what they have to have for services in those programs change. Um, so things like nursing staff or medical staff on site or psychiatry on gotcha. site. So those things increase. Um, so because we're community-based, our kids get the majority of their services in the community. So mm-hmm. outpatient based. Gotcha. Mm-hmm. And you also mentioned trauma informed development or trauma informed care. Care. Yeah. Trauma informed care. Mm-hmm. What is that? So huh, very broad question, but okay. yeah. Let's we're gonna dig in a little. Uh trauma informed treatment means that everything that we do and everything that we're working on is from a trauma informed lens. So okay. all of our kids have gone through some sort of trauma, whether it be uh, emotional trauma at well, all of them, because they've been removed from their homes, but also because of abuse and neglect that they've experienced or um, delinquency or um, cultural uh, trauma that they've had. And so we are working from a place of understanding their trauma, and then we are meeting them where they're at. Mm -hmm. So everything that we do in this program is trauma-informed. That's from the treatment that they receive, the uh, clinical treatment, um, the spaces that we have in the house, Uh, All of the language that we use, whether it's in documentation or how we're talking, all of the trainings that our staff get, everything that we do is trauma-informed. Okay. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. 
And and so you've got a bunch of kids living here yep. for all the reasons that you listed mm-hmm. and living in the apartment out yep. back. What does a typical day like your staff, what do y'all what are y'all taking care of? What does day to day action look like for yep. the people who work here? It's um hmm. every day is very different. Um it's almost like hurting teenagers, lots of them in one household. (laughs) So uh, we are working with them on um, getting up on time for school, going to school, being prepared for school, and then coming home and what that looks like. We do a lot of typical household type things. Mm -hmm. They come home from school, they have to do their homework, they have to do chores, they um, get to help pick activities that they're going to do, they help prep for dinner, uh, they help cook, um, they all sit down and eat dinner together. And then in the evenings, they do some sort of activity, whether it's out of the house or in the house. And then they have some, you know, quiet time. They can watch TV. They can, you know, hang out a little bit before they go to bed and do it all over again. Mm-hmm. And then on the weekends, holidays, vacations, things like that, it's it's a little bit more activity heavy. But all of the activities that we do with the kids have some sort of educational component to them, um, or they meet one of the domains of their treatment plans. And so mm-hmm. there's six domains that our kids work on, which is education, mental health, physical health, independent living, safety and behavior, and family and community. So those are their six domains of treatment. Mm -hmm. We have a coordinator for every one of those domains uh, that works with the kids in that area, but they also help uh, develop activities that can help increase the treatment in those areas. So that's the days are different, though. It really depends on what a kid has going on that day. Do they have therapy? Do they have appointments? Do they have uh, do they want to go prom dress shopping or do they need to go out for clothes shopping or things like that? So how many, you know, I don't know how many children Mm y'all have here at the moment, but I imagine there's more children than staff. Yes. Okay. (laughs) so how uh, how do you guys take care of dividing the responsibilities between how many children a staff member is taken care of. Mm-hmm. Oh, that person's kind of independent. Let them do their own thing. Like, mm-hmm. how do you guys come to those decisions of making sure that you have enough staff for the amount of children you have? So we have a ratio that we have to meet. Our ratio is one to three. So one staff to every three youth. Okay. Um, and that changes depending on the, the ratio doesn't change in terms of what we have to serve. But in terms of what our kids need individually, um, that's how we make the decision. So sometimes we have a kiddo who may need a one-on-one staff for a period of time because they're going through something or they're having a harder day. Sometimes we have, you know, two kids who get along really well together. So one staff will take them out to do an activity Mm -hmm. together. Or sometimes we can have all of them in one room doing an activity together, but we have three staff there kind of helping them out or four staff. So we can take 12 kids here in our main program, Mm -hmm. um, in the level two program. And then we can have four adults, technically 18 to 21 year olds in our independent living program. And I assume the they're a lot less hands-on. Yes. So that's a supported independent living. So we have two staff who work over there as uh, one is the coordinator, one is the case manager. Um, They work Monday through Fridays. And so we have somebody on site for them between the hours of like 9 a.m. and 10 p.m. But then the overnights and on weekends, they're kind of on their own. Yeah. They have on-call. They can call for emergencies. They can also come over here and talk to staff if they need to. But that's more supported independent living and they're adults. Yeah. So. Yeah. yeah. You, you know, it, we're here if you need us. Yes. <laughs> yes. If you have a problem, just call, but otherwise yes. you got it. Yep. Okay, cool, cool. And how did this organization get started? I saw on your website, it's been going for 130 years. Yeah. A long month. time. Yes. So what's the history of, of that? How did you know, what was the inspiration? How did this get going? Yeah. So um, in 1892, there was a group of women from the um, women's Christian temperance movement uh, who decided that there needed to be a place for Dover's, um, what they called, quote unquote, wayward and indigent children. Obviously, that's not the language that's used anymore. (laughs) Indigent. What does that even mean? Uh, Essentially, it means children that don't have support. They don't have families. Mm. They have no, you know, no housing, things like that. So it was started because of the wars that were happening and because uh, families were away, fathers were away, mothers had to go back to work, there was nobody to care for kids, um, or if grandparents were caring for children and they were aging. And so back then it was an orphanage, essentially. So uh, it was for kids zero to 18. 
Um, and at any given point, there were 60 to 70 kids in the house, um, in this house. Okay. So this house was actually built. It started being built in 1893, and it was completed in 1897 mm -hmm. um, as Dover Children's Home. So that's all we've ever been here in this building. Um, they started in two other houses here in Dover before they got to move into this house. Uh, over the years, that's changed. But back then, it was they had one to two house mothers that lived here with them. Um, so one... <laughs> two people for 60 kids. Yes. Yeah. And so they, but they ran it like a family, like a home. Mm -hmm. And I think that's one thing that we have tried to never change here, okay. uh, which is that even with all of the regulations and the rules and the laws that we have to follow in our licensing regs, even with all of that, we try and run it as much as possible as a home. Mm -hmm. Um, so back in this, I think the late sixties is when it was switched. Um, and we had to decrease the number of kids that were in the house because of laws. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then we switched to only working with adolescents when there were restrictions put around were there, uh, residential care. Have there been any other changes during the century long mission? Yes. Our, our missions changed. Um, however, not the underlying point of the mission, which is to serve youth uh, mm -hmm. who need a place to be served. Yeah. Give them the stability and, and basically runway to be able to, you know, take off. Right. So I, now it's, we work with youth. Yes, we work with adolescents. Um, however, we also take kids as young as 10. Um, not often, but it has happened. Um, so really we're working on having them be as productive members of the community as possible and to actually create hope for their future. Um, but we're not doing it for them. Uh, a lot of the words that we use are empowerment and helping them heal and providing resources and providing support, but it's it's really them doing the work. And so we took a lot of the language out that said that we were doing all of this work. Hmm. We're supporting the work that they're doing for themselves. So, gotcha. Yeah. Okay. Now, you, I do remember you were mentioning that the kids will want to do like prom dress shopping mm -hmm. or, you know, like they'll drive some of the initiative. Mm -hmm. What I guess I the question is uh, how much of how much of it is driven by them versus driven by the staff? Um, so that's a really interesting question. We actually run our program uh, based on youth voice, mm -hmm. um, and so and choice. So it's we call it youth and family voice and choice. And so they get all of the voice and the choice over what they do. We are not a compliance based program, mm -hmm. so we don't force compliance from kids. They choose to do what they choose to do, but they also understand that there are natural consequences to those things. Mm -hmm. um, so when it comes to their treatment and the things that they want to work on, they get all the say. We also, we will input and we will talk about, you know, what the expectations are in the program. And if they tell us, I want to do A, and we say, well, A doesn't fit within the model of the program, or it's not within the program expectations and rules, um, then we give them some, some controlled choice. So we give them, you can do this or you can do this, or you can choose to do neither of those things. That's not helping you. And there are natural consequences to that, but we don't force compliance here. So, so the kids get a lot of say over what they want to do, yeah. uh, over what activities they want to do and mentors that they want in their life and support people and um, who they want in their team meetings and what they want talked about in their team meetings. And, um, you know, and even sometimes about consequences when we talk about, you know, something that happened and. What do you think should be the consequence and where do you think, you know, we should draw the line on these things and would that be something we could support with another kid? And if it's not, why? Mm -hmm. And so we give them some understanding about the decision-making process also. Mm -hmm. um, and then we give them some voice in it. Is there any form of, I guess, discipline, disciplinary action that the staff or the organization does take? Yes. Yeah. So um, not necessarily... Nothing really harsh. Every they can't watch television some nights, you know, if they don't do their chores. Right. And we we really try and use some of that language, which is, you know, no, I'm sorry, you can't watch TV tonight. You were incredibly rude this afternoon, or you can't watch TV tonight because, you know, you didn't do any of your chores. You didn't clean your room, you didn't wash your dishes, somebody else had to do that for you. But we also have a community of of connection and support here uh, and around relationship building. So if a kid chooses not to do their chore or not to wash their dishes one day and somebody has to do it for them, they have to do a give back the next day, which means that they have to do something for somebody else. Mm -hmm. um, and so we really do that to help build and foster relationships. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I can see how that would, that natural of like, Hey, we're going to connect the punishment to the, to the behavior yep. and the punishment 
is you have to be nice right. to somebody else or right. the, the you know, I guess you know you're taking away the TV and they you know yeah. they they lose something that they value but the the give back is kind of what I was describing yeah. Yeah, your punishment for being rude is that you have to go be nice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think, and for us too, it's also our the biggest philosophy that we use here is around connecting mm. and building relationships. Yeah. So we actually use a model of care here called trust-based relational interventions. Okay. The entire purpose of that is to connect, empower, and correct youth, but that you can't get to that correcting piece unless you have a connection and unless you have that relationship where that child actually wants to listen and mm. wants to actually engage with you. And so everything we do here, not just with our kids, but also in terms of how we work with our staff mm -hmm. is all about relationship building. Well, I was talking to Mike Gillis yesterday mm -hmm. on the podcast, and we were talking about trust and how it affects broader communities from like, you know, like trust and government and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. But one of the things that I said was, you know, you have to all relationships require trust. You can't have a relationship with someone without trust. Correct. And there was an earlier person on my show, Draper Rogers, who is a pastor at a young adult pastor at uh, Gardendale First Baptist Church in Alabama. Mm -hmm. And my wife and I, we, we repeat this to each other sometimes where it's like he, he made a quote. It was, People don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. And like that was just yeah. such a wonderful little way of tying it up of like, you know, yeah. you you have to be emotional before you can be rational mm -hmm. <laughs> in a way, I guess. It's like you have to connect with like what you're yeah. saying. You have to connect with somebody emotionally before mm – -hmm before they will even listen to what you have to say. Yes. And we also, interestingly, um, and I think it connects really well with that, we use um, and have used, um, have you ever heard of um, Radical Candor? No. So it's actually, it's a book written by Kim Scott. She also has a podcast. She and she used to be an executive of some kind at, I believe, like Google and Amazon. And anyway, so she wrote this book called Radical Candor. Mm -hmm. And the entire thing is about how to lead by caring directly for your employees, or sorry, caring deeply for your employees while challenging directly. Mm. And so it's, very similar to what we do with the kids. Mm. We care deeply about them. And so we challenge them directly on their behaviors and on where they want to go and how they want to get there. If we don't have their buy-in on where they want to go in their life, it doesn't matter what I tell them to do. Yeah, it doesn't. They're not going to do it. And so if I care enough about their life, then they will have a buy-in to their own life. And oftentimes we are able to get more from our kids and we are able to push them further and have far more successes because we spend so much time building and rebuilding and constantly rebuilding those relationships. Yeah. It seems like with this, you know, you're going to, they're kids, you're going to have troublemakers or, you know, <laughs> they're teenagers. Yes. Yeah, you're going to have the moments where they're like, I'm kind of done with this. Mm -hmm. So how do you, how do you approach that those types of challenges, it, it, how do you, I guess, you know, we've talked broadly about how we do it in a, in a specific way. How would you approach that type of challenge? Yeah. You know, interestingly, we've actually had that challenge fairly recently mm -hmm. with some of our kids just not putting in the effort for their own progress and their own treatment. And so we challenged it directly, but we challenged them to say, this is your life and your decisions. And we're giving you a lot of choice where we want you to have this choice. However, if you are not able to handle that choice, should it be something that we handle? Should we be able to make decisions for you? Mm. Because right now you can't make them for yourself. It seems to be working actually really well with a couple of our kids that we did that with. Mm. And really it's about saying, you know, we can give you as much choice as possible, but if there's a safety concern or if there's an issue with your treatment, then we have to step in as the adults because we care about you. And so having this relationship doesn't mean not correcting them. It doesn't mean not consequencing them. What it does mean is utilizing the relationship that you have to be very clear and to challenge. Mm -hmm. And so we use what's called playful engagement a lot. And so it's like the first step in correcting a behavior. So, you know, say we have a kid who swears a lot. This is a good example because they're teenagers and they love to swear. <laughs> All us the adults, cool kids do it. To be fair, us adults swear. Yeah. And so we try and minimize it somewhat. And we really talk about time and place. And we really talk about like, how are you using it and why? Are you using it toward people? Because that's 
never acceptable? Mm -hmm. Or are you using it to emphasize something? And are there other words? But we talk about all of that stuff. But if we're trying to correct that behavior, you can probably hear me five, six, seven times a week saying, watch your language up there, but like joking around with them and they laugh and like we giggle about it, but they'll usually be like, oh, sorry, Renee. It's just and a gentle reminder. Correct. But it's playful. Yeah. And because wh why are we going to be harsh? Right. We're not there yet. Mm. However, we get into a situation where we have a kid swearing at another kid or swearing at a staff mm -hmm. and getting, you know, verbally aggressive. Well, that doesn't call for playful engagement. Mm -hmm. That calls for being very clear about what the expectation is and then allowing them to still make that choice. And we also don't say, well, if you don't do this, this is what's going to happen. We don't lay out the consequence. They know what the consequences are. Mm -hmm. They've been through this. They've been down this road. So instead we say things like, you know, we have discussed this. This is the expectation. At this point, your behavior is unacceptable. Mm -hmm. And it is your choice what you do with that next. But you know what will happen. And and that's on you. And then we walk away. Mm -hmm. Not walk away without support. Not walk away to be like, well, oh, we're not dealing with this. Mm -hmm. But to give them the opportunity and the space to make a different decision. We do not force it. We don't stand in their room, in their doorway so that they can't leave. We don't we don't do any of that. We give them space. We allow them options. And then we walk away. And it it works. It doesn't always work. Believe me, our, our kids have been through hell and back. Some of our kids have seen things that I will never understand, I will never see in my lifetime. Mm -hmm. Things that are unimaginable. And also they're here and they get up every single day. And so the majority of our kids here have had no control over their lives. They've had no say in being here. They've had no say in anything that's happened to them up until this point. So we try and give them some of that power back. Mm -hmm. And we even do that when they're having a hard time. So we, we still don't take their power away from them. They still get to choose, even if the choice is not the one we want them to mm -hmm. make. But they have to know that they have choice. And that ha helps to build the relationship. It helps to maintain the relationships. And then it helps us to come back and have a different conversation after. This incident happened, but we don't necessarily talk about the incident. We talk about what happened before that. Yeah. How did we get there? Yeah. How do we not get there again? You know, because I guess it's like, uh, you know, you can get mad about the details of something, but it, the details are not why you're mad. Mm -hmm. Typically, like yeah. there's some, uh, some underneath that, mm -hmm. you know, anybody who's been who's been married for any number of years will know will know that <laughs> that uh, behavior communicates something yeah. every time mm -hmm. and it usually is never what they're verbally saying mm -hmm. it's usually something much deeper underlying and if we focus just on the behavior we miss what they were communicating mm -hmm. and so we focus on what they were communicating yeah how does a kid you know you talked about the several types of uh instances mm -hmm. that kids will, you know, the circumstances, I, I think is a better word of yeah. how kids will end up here. Mm -hmm. How do y'all find those kids? Mm -hmm. They're referred to us from the state. Okay. So, um, or from other mechanisms, but typically because they've had some sort of community involvement or state involvement. So um, because there's been an abuse or neglect case through child protection services, or okay. there's been delinquency through um, juvenile justice. Um, and now more recently, we've actually been taking referrals also from the Bureau of Children's Behavioral Health in New Hampshire, uh, which means that these are kids that have been receiving services in home um, prior to becoming involved in a state system, but for whatever reason, they can't maintain in their home environment. Hmm. And so that's where we get our referrals from. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, with that in mind, that makes me wonder, how do parents respond normally to this type of stuff? Because, you know, I wasn't sure exactly how kids got here. And part of me thought maybe it's voluntary, mm -hmm. you know, in some ways, but it sounds like it might not always be voluntary. Yeah. How do parents normally, I guess, two questions, how do they respond to this? And as and how do parents get back to that point where, you know, Hey, I, I I'm, I'm capable. Mm -hmm. What, what does that process look like? So that's a challenging question to kind of answer because if, every if you don't kid, want to answer, no, 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 have to. I think it's fine. It just, it's broken up in parts. So we have um, some kids who have parental involvement. We have some kids who have guardian involvement, even though it might not be their parents, it may be a family member. 
The majority of our kids, though, are actually under state guardianship, and it's because um, okay. e their parents don't have parental rights or um, there's been a loss in the family or, you know, whatever the case is. So yeah. I think that um, it can be hard to answer because we have some kids now, if they're coming in through BCBH, that they're, they are here voluntarily. Well, their parents have sent them here or their families have sent them here voluntarily. So we've actually had more family involvement probably over the last two years than we've had in years past. Okay. Um, I think that the majority of those families are very engaged and they want to be engaged and they're really working on trying to provide support for their child. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we work really collaboratively together. In other cases, we're not working with families at all. And so what we do to kind of balance some of that is that we're trying to run a community-based program. And so we utilize the community by having a skilled volunteer program. And then some of those volunteers become mentors for our kids. And so one-on-one -on -one mentors where they end up building their own relationships, taking kids out, taking them for holidays and becoming a support person, whether they live here or somewhere else. Mm -hmm. And so um, we're really trying to build those connections for kids and not just from the people who get quote unquote paid to work with them. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, so you have volunteers from Dover or I guess mm -hmm. maybe not just always from Dover, just from, around the area. Yeah. From the region come in and volunteer to kind of meet those needs for those kids. Yeah. In what other ways does the community support Dover Children's Home? Yeah. What other, because I know you probably have sponsorships and you, mm -hmm. you obviously have financing that you have to keep up and mm -hmm. how do, how does the community support you in those ways? Oh, this is a huge question. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, I'm so getting we, to all no, these big questions. But they're they're good questions. It, it's a huge question because it's so many ways that the community okay. supports us. Um, so we've been around for 130. Next year is 100. Not next year. Next month is 130 years. Wow. Big anniversary plans? No, not for this one. We did something big for 125. Hmm. But, you know, we'll, we can't do it every five years. <laughs> as much as I love to throw a party, we can't do that. But the... The only reason we are still here mm -hmm. is because of the Dover community. Yeah. And so, you know, we have never received the hundred percent that it costs to care for a kid in this house uh, and through this program from the state. And so we have always had to make up a substantial amount of money in mm -hmm. our budget every year. Um, and so we have to do that through fundraising events. We have a lot of corporate donors. We have a ton of individual donors. Mm -hmm. The way that this community like lovingly wraps their arms around this program is something I've never seen before. Um, I have worked in multiple residential programs and foster care agencies where there's a lot of stigma from the community in which those agencies are or those organizations or those houses. And there's a lot of stigma about around the kids that are in those programs. Okay. And that has not, not one time have I seen that in eight years here. There has never been a bad word spoken about our program, about the kids that are living in our program, about uh, the services that they need or the supports that they need. Um, and instead, anytime we ask for help in any way, shape or form, we are inundated with support from this community. And it is the only way that we have been able to do this. Mm -hmm. It's also the only way that our kids get some of the things that they need and want to be able to be successful. I mean, just an example. So we, my clinical team put together what they, what they called the um, empowerment boutique. Sounds very silly, but it's lovely. We have some kids who have some trauma around going shopping and around their own um, self-esteem and insecurities. Uh, and it was actually very triggering for some of their, their traumatic experiences. And so they wanted to create this empowerment boutique where we could bring in brand new clothes and accessories and makeup and shoes and, you know, backpacks and all of these things where the kids could actually go back to school shopping in that boutique if they didn't want to go out in the community to go shopping. And so we put out this call to action on Facebook, which we are just, I, it was just insane, but we put out this call to action and within 48 hours, I have to tell you the thousands of dollars that came in and the thousands of dollars worth of clothing and shoes and accessories that came in, the outpouring from this community was insane mm -hmm. to the point where at, after like two weeks, we had to say, please stop. We have no more room <laughs> for clothes. 
And, but we were, we still have a ton. And so now every season we actually get to kind of change out the clothes. The kids get to go back in there and it was incredibly successful. Kids that had not gone clothes shopping in years because Mm -hmm. they just couldn't stand to do it, had brand new clothes that they were super psyched about. And they did it with the clinical staff. So there was a lot of, you know, processing and having conversations and, and really uplifting messages while it was happening. Mm -hmm. But it's stuff like that. Like that is how our community shows up Mm -hmm. and they show up by coming to our fundraising events. Um, we have food donors, dinner donors who, um, cook a dinner every uh, once a month, if you will, or they bring in the ingredients and the recipe for a dinner once a month. We have almost every night covered every single month. Awesome. I mean, when I tell you the support that we have is the only reason that we have been as successful as Mm -hmm. we are. I honestly just, I've never seen anything like it. It's one of the reasons why I adore working here. Awesome. Yeah. Well, you mentioned some fundraising events. What Mm -hmm. types of events do y'all do? Are these public facing events? Because when I went to Homewood, they would do like a chili a chili cook off or something Mm -hmm. and they'd get a bunch of businesses to, and that was one of their fundraisers. Yeah. So do y'all do any kind of like public type stuff that Mm -hmm. maybe the community could attend and get involved with? Yeah. So we actually have four fundraising events that we do every year. Okay. Um, the first one that we do, so our fiscal year runs October to September. So the first one we do is actually the first Saturday of October, which is actually a big one for Dover. It's apple harvest day. Y'all do that? So we do part of it. So the chamber puts on Apple Harvest Day and in Lower Henry Law Park uh, is uh, the what's called the kiddie zone So okay. for kids. And so there's a big area. Um, we get uh, a sponsor to help us rent inflatables and the, the people at Blast Party Rentals actually help donate some of them. Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, and so we put up about 15 inflatables with them and then Dover Children's Home actually sells tickets and we get all of the proceeds from those tickets and the chamber does not charge us for the space that we use in Lower Henry Law Park. These are just, again, little things that, that yeah. this community does. Not little. Those are pretty big because we take in a decent amount of money. Yeah. But that's a huge community event, and we love being a part of it. Mm-hmm. Um, and then also myself and our di- our director of development, we sit on the committee for Apple Harvest Day with the chamber. And so okay. we also help with all of Lower Henry Law Park, not just the area that we do. So Apple Harvest Day is done by the chamber. Correct. And the chamber helps you guys out yep. by giving you space to set up. Yep. Okay. And so, um, and then we sit on the, on the committee and, and help kind of put on the event with them, uh, which I just, I love that partnership. It's actually a lot of fun, yeah. uh, but that's the first Saturday of every October. Um, and then we put on our bowl every year, which we actually had last weekend. Okay. bowl Yep. Yeah. So we, um, have people sign up of teams, uh, of four to six. There's four sessions throughout the day. We did it this year for the first time at bowl in Portsmouth, mm-hmm. um, it was an incredible event. I can't wait to like tell you. But <laughs> so that event, actually, anyone can sign up, businesses, families. It's a really fun event. It's all day long. Um, and they can come and bowl for free. But what we ask is that all of the teams get mm-hmm. pledges to bowl. And so they help bring in the money. Um, and so last year, I think we had a gross of about 31, a little over $31,000 for the day. And we had a net... Um, income from that event of 27,000. This year though, we had, um, a gross of over Mm 42,000 and a net of, um, almost 42,000. Wow. It was a phenomenal day. And I have to say, Bolarama in Portsmouth gave us the bowling alley for free for the day. So we, we had almost like very little in expenses. Yeah. They were amazing. It was the best run event. It was so seamless. It was an absolutely beautiful day. Everyone got involved. We had teams that brought in like, we had one team that brought in almost $10,000. We had another team who brought in $8,000. They're the reason that it was so successful. Yeah. Um, so that was awesome. That was last weekend. So we do that in April every year. Our next event though is June 8th, which we have our tasting tour. This is also open to the public. People can buy tickets. What do we We taste? Yeah. So we sell 200 tickets. It's a beer and wine tasting um, and uh, also food. And so it's done at Blue Latitudes um, and they put on the whole thing for us. Uh, Really, they help plan the entire thing. They figure out the menu. They get all of the distributors and we sell tickets. Um, And it's just, it's it's a really fun night. Obviously Mm -hmm. not a family friendly event. This is more of an adult event. Yeah. Uh, but it's definitely a, a lot of fun. We love it. So this is our 
16th, I think, okay. our 16th tasting tour. And our bowl was the 15th. So the, so the kids here get to go to the bowl Correct. But they don't get to go. Not to... the tasting tour. No, no, no. They don't get to go to the tasting tour. That one, sadly, no. But um, And then our last one that we do is actually in August, and that will be our golf tournament. This is our 15th annual golf tournament, which is at the Lynx in mm-hmm. um, South Berwick. And that one, I believe, is August... August 14th. Ha ha. I almost forgot. Um, but that one, we can have 144 golfers. It's a little, it's a smaller event, um, a little bit more exclusive just because it's for people who golf. Mm -hmm. It's not cheap. Right. So we're, we're, so every event has its own thing. So we have a family friendly event. We have kind of like a a classy adult, you know, dress up event, but it's more for the whole community and people can buy tickets. And then we have kind of a little bit more of an exclusive event, which is the, which is our golf tournament. So I, I, I see the, the strategy there of like, <laughs> Hey, you know, we're going to do fundraising with different groups. Yes. Right. Mm-hmm. So, you know, this group, that group, and then, and, yep. and then the golfer people. Yep. <laughs> and then Apple Harvest Day, which is like a whole community, yeah, event, yeah, which yeah. means people are going to come out anyway. They're not just coming out for Dover Children's Home. Uh, they're coming out to be a part of Apple Harvest Day. And we actually get to market a little bit about what we do and get more people involved yeah, that yeah. way. Um, but that's a big event for us because we have to have like 75 volunteers for that event. And we never have a shortage. It is, we, I shouldn't say that. We always scrape by because that's a lot of people and you're asking people to take their day away from going to yeah. Apple Harvest Day. But we have dedicated volunteers who are incredible. And so we're very they, fortunate for doing they it. They volunteer every year. We have a lot that volunteer every year. The UNH um, rowing teams, the men's and women's rowing teams, they come every year um, to volunteer with us. So the kids from from those, I shouldn't call them kids, but the college students from those, uh, those teams come and volunteer. So there's yes. usually like 30 kids. I said it again. Uh, 30 <laughs> college students who come and help us. So, yeah. And they're all like super... <laughs> I yeah. imagine rowing, they're like... I mean, ish, yeah. But they yeah. also have a lot of fun and they're really good with the kids. And, yeah. you know, they've been they've been super supportive. We've had them every year since I've been here. So this um, past October was like the eighth year that I've done Apple Harvest Day and, and we've had them every year. So. That's awesome. Yeah. So you've mentioned volunteers a lot. And mm-hmm. I imagine I imagine it can be difficult to recruit for that. But you make, you make it sound like it's easy. <laughs> yeah. Uh, what are the benefits of like, I'm a big believer in volunteering and, and I think that, you know, that it, there's a lot of value in that for yeah. the organization as well as for the volunteer. Yeah. What are some of the benefits of volunteering for the Dover Children's Home? And what are, I guess, some kinds of roles yeah. that people can volunteer for? So previously, um, when we've asked for volunteers, it's really just been, we've had a couple of volunteers who have consistently helped out in the house, like they help out in the kitchen or um, they help out around the holidays with donations that come in um, or they help out in our front office. Over the last year though, my team has really pushed this idea of mentoring for kids and getting volunteers from the community more involved as we are a community-based program. And so my team really worked to put together a skilled volunteer program. Mm -hmm. So we started in, I believe it was in August or September that we started having monthly volunteer information sessions. So people can go on our website and fill out applications to become volunteers. And then we invite them to a monthly volunteer information night, which we actually have tonight for a group that has come through. And then once they go through that information night, if they're still interested, then they go through training, they have to do background checks, they have to, you know, there's there's a lot of pieces that go into that. I mean, you got to make sure that the kids are protected, right? Yes. So, So, and then we... We have them go through a bunch of processes with our staff and and to make sure that we can get them involved and engaged in the right places. Mm -hmm. So some of those volunteers are still just coming to do events or, you know, doing stuff offsite or they're coming to help in the kitchen or, you know, they're helping us clean out spaces in the house because it's an old home and we house a lot of things um, that that sit here for a long time uh, and we lack storage. So um, they've helped us out in a tremendous amount of ways. And then as we've brought them into the house and they've actually met our kids and gotten to know them, some of them have naturally become mentors for our kids and Mm. others we've set up from the beginning to be mentors for kids Mm. because of their interests and who they are. Yeah. So 
What happened, though, was because we had such um, an influx of interest in becoming volunteers, this is actually going to be our last monthly volunteer information night until the end of the summer, um, because we need to really get everyone through the process yeah. and get these volunteers set up with activities and engage them because we want to keep them. We got to figure um, out a job for everybody to yes. do. <laughs> and which is a, an amazing problem to have. Right. But when we opened up just general volunteering for Dover Children's Home, know that the response was insane. That's awesome. Um, and so every volunteer info night that we've had, we've had anywhere from four to 10 potential volunteers in the room. Um, and I think that we have an active volunteer list now of like 30, mm. which has never been the case. We've usually had two or three that were consistent volunteers on a weekly basis. And so this is a huge change for us. Yeah. Um, and an awesome thing to have. It's so, a huge win for us. It's an amazing win right? for us. And <laughs> the people that we have met in doing this have been just amazing. I mean, what they want to give back to the program, but more importantly to these kids is it's just, it's not something that we can necessarily give them as paid staff all the time, mm. but these are the people that are showing up because they want to, and they're building relationships with kids because they want to. Mm. And it is, it's just, it's been like pure gold for our kids. That's honestly. awesome. Yeah. That's so we're, cool. We're really excited about that. So over the eight years that you've been here, mm -hmm. what are some stories that you've been able to like that has impacted you that you've been able to take away and it's like, you know, you think, man, that was, that was important. Uh, there's been so many. Mm. Um, I can probably tell you the name of every kid that has come through this program over the past eight years mm -hmm. and relationships that I've had with them. But I think the things that have impacted me the most, um, the first summer that I was here, we decided to take the kids on vacation. Mm -hmm. And it was something that had been a tradition here years in, you know, previously, and it just hadn't happened for quite some time. So we decided to take the kids on vacation. Uh, in the summer, we took them away for like five days to Williamsburg, Virginia and Washington, DC. Very cool. Um, and we, it, there were a lot of pitfalls cause we had never done it before. Um, but it also created memories for kids that I don't know that we actually thought the impact that it was going to have. Mm. So the following year, we had four kids graduate from high school and one kiddo got his own apartment. And so um, because we were celebrating such big things, we did a big trip. The board was amazing and said yes to us doing this. And we took, there were 16 of us uh, and we flew to Nashville mm -hmm. and we rented a house uh, and we were there for seven days. Um, and it was, uh, they got to go to the Grand Ole Opry and we went zip lining and we went to the botanical gardens. The thing that stuck out the most though, was the house that we stayed in. It had an indoor pool and an outdoor pool and a hot tub. And we all stayed in the same house but the kids um, roasted s'mores for the first time. And it's actually a memory that people talk about to this day. Really? So this was six years ago. Mm -hmm. And then every year since then, we've gone on some sort of vacation, Maine, Vermont. Um, and now we go to this house on the Cape, which is actually part of a nonprofit. And they give us the house for free wow. um, for five days in the summer. And so we've done that for the past three years. But the kids also go to Acadia every summer and they go on a whitewater rafting trip overnight. And I have to say that the thing that has stuck with me the most is these vacations because yeah. I've gone on every single one except for Acadia and whitewater rafting, but I've gone on all the other bigger trips, not because I have to, but because it is the best way to build relationships and for mm. the kids to see me as a human being and vice versa. Yeah. As, um, a, as opposed to like, oh yeah, that's... That's the executive director. Yeah, yeah. Right. And like, I need to be afraid of her. I can get in trouble with her. And I'm like, no, I'm not. That's not me. But it's also... You don't realize um, how much childhood memories stick with someone mm. until they haven't had any positive ones really to build from. Yeah. So most people go on family vacations or at least have some sort of trip. Or uh, And when we went to Nashville, uh, one out of the eight kids that we brought uh, had ever been on an airplane. Okay. And so that was interesting because now yeah. we have seven teenagers on an airplane for the first time. Yeah. It, with their own trauma and their own triggers. They've never and, traveled. And they've never traveled. And we had, luckily we had eight staff with us. So we did a one-to-one -one ratio because we knew it was going to be tough, but the learning opportunities and the experiences and the things that I will never forget, which one of them was roasting marshmallows with a kid for the first time who cried because of how delicious it was. And interestingly, last week we interviewed her, uh, myself and our director of operations are doing a a seminar or presentation at a national conference next month mm -hmm. in Minneapolis. 
as part of our presentation, we're interviewing previous residents that lived here. Um, and so she obviously lived here about six years ago. And as we were doing the interview, that was actually the the number one memory that she remembered was making s'mores for the first time in Nashville. Yeah. And I still remember it to this day. So like to know that that memory for me was just as like poignant and just as um, memorable for yeah. her is amazing. And for her to say like, no, the connections that I had with staff here, the relationships that I have with staff, I knew I was safe. I knew. Yeah. And it's those things. It's hearing those kids come back and, you know, having them come back and tell us their stories about after they left here, even if they didn't leave positively. We have a lot of them that come back and they're like, no, all of these seeds that you planted for me have allowed me to get to this place mm. or this was really rough after I left here. And then I remembered this, or they get to come back and tell us their success stories. And, you know, our door is always open for them. And mm. uh, it's just, I, those are the things that stick with me because yeah. the everyday successes are not always there and it can be very hard to find them because we're dealing with teenagers on a daily basis, teenagers who have had trauma, but teenagers, yeah. I mean, anyone who remembers what it's like to be a teenager, it isn't easy. Yeah. And now you have 28 adults telling you what to do on any given day. It can't be easy, right? Mm. So it, that's the stuff. Those are the stories that stick with me. It's not that they're perfect. It's not that they're positive. Mm. It's not that they made the biggest successes in life. It's that we were able to create memories for them. We were able to plant yeah. seeds for them that, that they wouldn't have had otherwise. You know, my takeaway from all of that is the, it's not like the, oh, huge achievements or these massive things that were accomplished. It's just these small, tiny, intimate yes. kind of moments yep. that really made the difference. Mm -hmm. and, and not just for them, and for me. And you don't realize how small actions mm -hmm. have that, uh, I'll use a banking term, like the compounding interest. Yes. Right? Of So true. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that uh, just builds over time, mm -hmm. you know? Wow. Yeah. That's yeah. cool. That's awesome. Thank you so much for sharing that. Yeah, thank you. How did you, you said that you did some other foster work and stuff mm -hmm. like that prior to this. Yeah. It seems to me like you've had an interest in working with kids mm -hmm. for many years. What got you inspired to do this type of work and how did you end up here? Yeah. So we focus a lot here on like, what is your why? Okay. If you don't know what your why is and you don't know what your purpose is, then uh, you are not going to be able to be effective for anyone um, because this job is not easy. So I remember it all the time. My why really is I, when I was in high school, I had a friend of mine who was in foster care. It was something I had never heard of. I never knew of. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't realize that those systems even existed. I was very sheltered. I, not in a bad way, but like had a very typical, um, upbringing, yeah. you know, I, those things were not something I was well, aware it, of. If it's not in front of you, who's, what adult is going to be like, Hey, let me teach you about the foster children's care system right. today. You Interestingly, know? my parents had been foster parents before I was even born. Oh. So you'd think I would have heard of it, but I had no idea. And so she had started talking to me about the experiences that she had had and uh, why she was in foster care and what that looked like and how it felt. And I went away to college to become an early childhood teacher and very quickly within like three months realized that was not for me. Um, but the school that I went to focused really heavily on social work. Mm -hmm. And I started talking to some of the teachers there and I realized that I could actually change that system and I could help and hopefully help to foster some change in that mm -hmm. foster care system. So um, I decided to get my degree in social work and I did and, and got out of school and then went back and got my master's. And um, when I got out, worked in a residential treatment program as a clinician and then went and um, uh, as a clinical supervisor at a foster care agency, became the director of that foster care agency for quite some time before I came here. In all of that, I realized that I like administrative social work mm -hmm. because I like to be part of the change that helps all of the kids, not just one. But my entire focus has always been on children and adolescents and their families and, and around how to make the system different. And so okay. I left residential care because I could not stomach how kids were treated in residential care. And um, it was all compliance-based. 
There were so many restraints happening, um, kids being secluded in quiet rooms because they're having behaviors. And I just, I couldn't stomach it. So I ended up leaving residential and went to do foster care instead. And then this job became available. And I happened to find it one day and I was like, I don't, I can't go back to residential. I can't do it. And it kept popping up and I was like, oh, all right, there's a reason. So I applied for it. I came in for the interview and midway through the interview, I asked the preceding mm -hmm. executive director how many restraints, how often restraints happen in this yeah. program. And she said, we haven't had a restraint in this program in almost a decade. And I said, I'm sorry, what? Yeah. <laughs> and she said, yeah, we haven't. And we don't do seclusion and, uh, you know, we don't have quiet rooms and we don't have a points and level system. And we run the house like a home. Mm. Um, we don't run the house like an institution. And because of that, restraints are just not something that we do. Yeah, We're trained in it. We have to be. And so I was like, oh. So when I was offered the job, I was like, no, this is like the perfect catalyst for system change in terms of how we treat kids who are in residential care and how we do trauma-informed care. Mm -hmm. Because I, I truly believe that you cannot necessarily have the level of restraints and seclusion in residential care and also say that you're trauma-informed mm. because restraints and seclusion are not therapeutic and they can be triggering and they can be more traumatizing for yeah. youth, but yeah. they can also be traumatizing for your staff. It creates a high burnout. It creates a hugely stressful environment where it's already a stressful environment. Mm -hmm. um, and I just, uh, I, it's not something that we've ever pushed. And so we have now uh, been almost 17 years restraint and seclusion free in this program. Very cool. So it is something we're very proud of, um, but it's also something that we work very hard at all the time. Um, and it's also something that we're now pushing, not just us, but to other residential programs in New Hampshire. And it's why myself and our director of operations are doing that um, seminar in uh, at a national conference next month, um, which is around restraint and seclusion free residential care uh, and youth voice and choice. Very cool. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Hmm. That's so, that's interesting that that level of uh, interaction was what kind of pushed you away from it. It was like, no, I don't, I don't want to, we can do better than that. Yeah. I don't want to. I didn't want to be a part of it. Yeah. I didn't want to be a part of re-traumatizing youth. And I also got traumatized more than enough times with watching the restraints, being part of restraints. And I just, I'm sure you just can, didn't feel You good. could just see the hurt. Yes. Yeah. And those relationships that you build with kids, the minute you restrain them, that relationship's gone mm -hmm. and you're almost never going to get it back. Yeah. It is really hard to rebuild that trust, that this idea of felt safety, our kids no longer feel safe with you, even if they were doing something that you thought or that a person thought that, you know, they needed to be kept safe from we truly believe that there's another way to do it. I mean, yeah. all of our kids here have had, not all, I shouldn't say that, but a lot of kids here have had some sort of um, property damage. We've had kids put their, their hands through windows, put their hands through walls, you know, break glass, kick things, all of that stuff. It's not an imminent risk to them or to anyone else. Maybe if they put their fist through a window... I'm not going to restrain them after the fact. They've probably already hurt themselves. Yeah. And so now we're at that cool down point. This is where we can rebuild a relationship. But also, how do we give kids the physical attention that they need and mm. that they want because they're still children yeah. without it having to be something that they seek out through the needing to get restrained? So we do that, but kids can ask for hugs. They can ask for high fives. We do a lot of like spa days where we do, like do their nails because then we're holding their hand mm -hmm. and things that are appropriate, things that are, you know, always monitored because obviously boundaries, but, but that are appropriate because everyone deserves physical touch if they want it and mm -hmm. if they need it. And it shouldn't have to be done in a way that is traumatizing and yeah. aggressive and forceful. And so it's not something that we do here. And I, because of that, I mean, we've had plenty of people work here and that still work here that used to work in other residential treatment programs, just like me, who come in and they're like, how do you do this without restraints? And then they, by the time they leave, they're like, oh my God, how do we not do it without restraints? <laughs> yeah. Like how do, how have we always done this and thought it was, it was an okay practice. Yeah. And I'm not saying that the way other programs do it is wrong. I'm saying that it's not something that we believe in and that we're trying to do things differently. We're trying to redefine 
group home care and residential care for adolescents and for kids because it's important that mm -hmm. we're not re-traumatizing them. It's important that the system is actually working to help them. And that's not been the case. Yeah. So what do you think is the future? What is your vision for Dover Children's Home? Where where do you hope it ends up in the, in the future? Kind of where are you taking it? Yeah, we are really hoping to expand our services, not just to do residential treatment. We're really hoping to do something along the lines of foster care um, okay. so that we are still providing that level of treatment for youth and children and their families uh, under our same mission, um, but we're doing it in different capacities. So it's not just residential treatment, but also how do we give them more permanency? How do we give them more community-based opportunities? Mm -hmm. How do we give them more supports? So we're really hoping for that. Um, you know, we're also really hoping to be able to do a lot of that advocacy work for um, reducing and eliminating restraint and seclusion in residential treatment. So it's why we're kind of branching out and now doing some of these conversations. It's why I was really excited to do the podcast too, because I get to talk about these things to an audience that wouldn't normally hear it. Yeah. And so, um, yeah, so that's what we're really hoping for moving forward. All righty. Very yeah. cool. And our theme for this season is building bridges. Mm hmm and overcoming disagreement, which I kind of feel like we've been talking about <laughs> a, how I feel, yeah. a lot of that yeah. in this episode. Mm -hmm. So it might be, a, I don't know, it might be redundant, but I'll give you an opportunity <laughs> yeah. to be specific. What are some ways that people out there, not just kids, mm -hmm. but adults even, because, yeah. you know, there's a lot of division out there and people mm -hmm. need to know yeah. how can you build bridges? How can you overcome disagreement? I'm actually going to take the quote from Radical Candor, which okay. is, you care deeply and you challenge directly, Okay. but that you also then have to respect other people's opinions. It doesn't mean that you have to agree with them. It doesn't mean that you have to, that you even have to accept how they feel if it's not the way that you feel. It does, however, mean that if you want to ever get to a different place, you have to be a kind human being. You have to care about other people regardless of their opinions because they're still human beings. Mm -hmm. And then you still have to be able to welcome them to the table and hear their opinion. And that is really hard to do. I think it's something that we struggle to do with um, in our culture right now uh, because of the divisiveness. Yeah. Um, but remembering that regardless of what people may think in their minds, that we are still all human beings looking for the same thing, which is connection and, you know, the opportunity to be heard. And so if you remember that, if you go at it with that intention, I think that, you know, we can we can bridge those divides. Yeah. Mike Gillis was talking about how face-to-face -face really changes the way that you interact with people. 100%. And so what you're talking about kind of reminds me of like, you know, being respectful to other people and, 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 you know, not accepting exactly everything that they're saying, but, mm -hmm. you know, kind of like listening to them and, and, and giving them that space to express it. You really lose a lot of that when you go online and it's so oh, easy, sure. it's so easy to forget that the avatar is a person. There's a person behind it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, and people can hide behind those things. Mm. People can say whatever it is that they want and there's limited consequence in terms of seeing or understanding or even having to validate another person's feelings because you don't see them. Mm. There's no connection there. I, I completely agree with that. I mean... We lived a very different life during COVID here because we didn't close down. We still had kids who lived here. We still had to be here every day. Mm -hmm. And so we still always had that connection. We lost some of that connection in terms of meetings and, and you know, other adults that we had to bring into the program. But we actually gained an even bigger connection with our kids. But the isolation that they felt from their peers and then the issues that they had with being online and mm. safety around that and bullying and things like that, that increased um, mm -hmm. like crazy because there was a, it was a lot easier to not have to put a face to the emotional hurt. Yeah. Hmm. So it was, I think we had a different experience, but also we were still, and we will for years deal with the effects of the isolation and, hmm. and I think losing that human connection. Yeah. One of the things that I'm hopeful about is that, that temporary amount of isolation really reminded people of hey, it, there's this valuable thing that, that we're leaving behind and we need to get back to. Yes. That's what I'm hoping for. In some for. way. Yeah. I'm hoping for that as well. Yeah. Um, I'm, I, I am really cautiously optimistic that we're moving in that direction. Yeah. Yeah, me too. Yeah. 
what do you think the city of Dover should focus on next? <laughs> I think just continuing. Okay. Uh, they're the way that they do things here in Dover, yeah. it is keep it going. It is one of the most connected communities that I have ever seen. And it's it's not just the people who've lived here for years. It's also the people that have come in over the last few years and and since I've been here that have moved here that instantly get involved in the community. They instantly um, you know, put themselves out there and you know, even younger professionals, they may not even work in Dover, but they're becoming involved in activities here. And I don't know, there's something kind of unique and special about this community um, that all of the businesses are so intertwined, even if they have similar businesses, mm -hmm. they're, they're collaborating and they're communicating. And um, I don't know, I just think continue down that path and, um, you know, continue to build up the city, but in a, in a way that really fosters connection with everyone instead of, um, I think not just building more housing, but yeah. actually how do we build it in a way that is, um, connecting people to the community. Yeah. I think one of those things, I don't okay. know if you've heard about CAP, which is Community Action Partnership of Stratford County. Mm -mm. Uh, it's a huge nonprofit organization here in Dover, it covers all of Stratford County. And, um, they are working on, I believe it's them. I may mess this up. So do some research before you decide to put this on there. But, okay. <laughs> uh, but I think they're building um, tiny homes uh, specifically for workforce housing. Okay. Um, but I think they're going to open it up to people who work in nonprofits first. Mm -hmm. uh, and so it, it's actually right on, oh, I can't remember the name of the road, um, but um, it's stuff like that, that this community does and that the city helps mm -hmm. to foster so that it can move through mm -hmm. um, and it can be pushed forward because a lot of places wouldn't allow something like that. I don't know. It's just such a unique community and I, I don't ever want that to change. Yeah. Um, I, I want them to continue to evolve in it, but but with that same kind of um, foundation, if you yeah. will. Well, so some of the people that I interviewed for Gardendale, they talked about community and they said, you know, you have to focus on it, mm -hmm. right? So yeah. you have to focus on keeping community. Mm -hmm. So I think that's a great focus, yeah. you know, obviously yeah. I care about that. That's what I care about as community. So I think that's great. Yeah. Is there anything that you wanted to add before we close out? No, I just thank you so much for doing this. It's actually, it's really inspiring for me. I had to, you know, prepare for this, but also, um, it reminded me of all of the reasons and, you know, I'm looking through all the reasons why we do this and why we think we're an incredible program. And I will boast about my staff and, and my kids all day long mm -hmm. and, uh, and this program and this community, because I, I don't know, we've just been so successful for 130 years because of it. And mm -hmm. it is, um, I don't know. We're just, I'm really excited about this podcast and to be a part of it. So awesome. thank you. Well, thank you for joining us and thank you for listening to the Your City podcast. If you enjoyed our conversation today with Renee, uh, you can share this show with somebody that you think would also enjoy it. We really appreciate that. We don't have a big advertising budget. So thank you for any word of mouth that you give us. And we appreciate you taking the time to do it. Thank you for listening and we will catch you on the next one.